Dear congregation, let us turn in God's holy word to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, just a few verses, and then also John, the gospel, according to John chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, we heard last time, we looked at the series on Elisha, how they had returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land, and uh, the sons of the prophets were before him, and there was a pot of stew made, and it uh, became poisonous because of the gourds that were sliced into it, those wild gourds, and, and there was death in the pot. And, uh, but the pot was cured by the word of the Lord, and, and there was no harm in it, so it could provide for the subsistence. And immediately following, we find our text, verse 42. Then a man came from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, Give it to the people that they may eat. But his servant said, What? Shall I set this before a hundred men? And he said again, Give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and so have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. And let's turn to John chapter 6 as we fast forward into the time, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word that was made flesh. John chapter 6. We'll read the first 14 verses. And these thing, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were d diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. After Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. And so when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Amen. May God bless the reading of his precious and infallible word. Dear congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, last time we looked at 2 Kings chapter 4, we recognized that a time of famine is a difficult time, and maybe we can't comprehend what it would be. And yet we also recognize that this famine, especially in the Old Testament here, as Israel had turned their backs on God, was also a sign of God's judgment upon them. And 
we're recalling here as we see these miracles done through the life and ministry of Elisha, that God's protection and provision for his people is absolutely amazing. Even in times of judgment, we're reminded, behold, Psalm 33, verse 18 and 19, behold, the eye of the Lord is upon those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Now, at the same time, we do well to acknowledge that God is perfectly sovereign, and there are times when God's people suffer many things. They suffer greatly. We ought not to be surprised by suffering. And there are those who have been poisoned or die of starvation. But even as we ought not to be surprised by suffering because it's a general consequence of sin, and each one of us must die. However, from an eternal perspective, those who are translated by God's grace into his glorious presence for all eternity will indeed feast for eternity with the Lamb of God. And so, as the psalmist says, in his mercy he saves our soul from death. And our soul's nourishment is therefore even more important than our physical, bodily nourishment. As we pointed out last week, we recognize that there is a greater famine than a famine that would affect our physical cares and concerns. And that is a spiritual famine, a famine of the Word of God that is prophesied of in Amos chapter 8. They will search for it, and there will be a spiritual famine, a famine of the word of the Lord in the land. Because we recognize, even as Jesus says, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. And this is exactly what Jesus is also teaching his disciples in John chapter 6. As he is indeed the, the greater prophet the prophet that was sent by God, the greater than Elisha. And here in these parallel passages, we see Elisha and our compassionate Savior illustrate their care for the needs not only of our soul, which is primary, but also our bodies. Multiplying the very resources that were available and if he does so even in our bodies and for our bodies, how much more then would he do so for our souls? And so Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these material things will be added to you. Here as we look at God's multiplying provision in these few verses in 2 Kings 4, verse 42 through 44, want to learn from this man from Baal Shalisha. And secondly, we want to learn a few things from the man of God, namely Elisha. And thirdly, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, then, learning from the man from Baal Shalisha about God's multiplying provision. Who is he? He's just a man. Man. There's no name given to him. And that's rather striking. There's no name given to this man who comes to provide such a generous gift. You know, sometimes you see plaques on on a, on a park bench because there was a, a donation made to this beautiful park and there they donated also this park bench with the, put a plaque on it so you know who contributed to it. But here there's no name. A no-name man. That surprised me because we don't know who he is but he's, he's not a king. You might think that one of the kings who... Elisha helped in 2 Kings chapter 3, 
Jehoram or Jehoshaphat would have recognized the need that Elisha and these sons of the prophets were in and sent food to them. And you would have said, well, that's not so surprising at all. Or you could think of this notable woman from Shunem at the beginning of chapter 4 who had great wealth and, and recognized the need of Elisha and these sons of the prophets, inquired of her husband saying, let's send something to the man of God for raising our son from the dead. But it's not a notable man even. It's just a plain old man from Baal, Shalisha. It's also then important to understand then where he's come from. We don't know the exact location of Baal Shalisha. It may not have been terribly far from Gilgal, but it, we, we, we know this from Scripture that first Sam, this is the only place in Scripture that the name Baal Shalisha, the city's name, comes up. But we also know that in 1 Samuel 9, when, Sam, when Saul is going out and looking for his father's donkeys, he went through Ephraim and Benjamin and, and through Be uh, Shalisha. Shalisha. And that, that's the only other time we find a name very similar to this, the land of Shalisha. And if it was within close proximity then as he was looking for his donkeys to Benjamin and Ephraim there, then we recognize that it may have been within a day's journey of Gilgal. But what's notable about this name is not Shalisha so much, but the fact that it's called Baal Shalisha. Jezebel, Ahab's wife, who brought in the worship of Baal and all of the priests and the prophets of Baal has hijacked the names of the cities and translated them into Baal Shalisha, knowing that this is now a city stamped by darkness and idolatry in Baal Shalisha. It'd be like St. George suddenly deciding it'd be because there's a huge Mormon influx that come into St. George. We're going to change the name. Not, no, there'll be no longer St. George, but Mormon George. Or there's a huge influx of Muslims come into Brantford, and we're no longer going to call it Brantford. We're going to call it Muhammad Ford. It, this is what's happened in this day. Baal has... Baal worship has taken such a deep root into the society that even the names of the cities were changed to their gods. And yet in the darkness of all of this idolatry, the light of God's grace and the light of His people, the light of His faithfulness shines through this man, this no-name man from Baal Shalisha. What an encouragement for Elisha. As he's suddenly, this man comes from Baal Shalisha. And he, he's bringing something. He's bringing food during famine. But what's even more encouraging for Elisha is what he's bringing in particular. That's the details that are found in our passage. It's about what he brings here. As this man brings to the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread, and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. This is the bread of his first fruits. You see why this would be so encouraging to Elisha? Because in Exodus 23, the people of Israel, Judah, were called to bring to the Lord and to his house, the fru first fruits of their harvest. And here, instead of bringing it to these prophets of Baal in Baal Shalisha, to the priests of Baal in Baal Shalisha, he's bringing the first fruits to Elisha. And he's bringing first fruits in a time of famine. 
He's not bringing the leftovers after, after you wonder if you're going to get through the week or the year. No, he's bringing the first fruits. And he's bringing of those first fruits 20 loaves of barley bread. Now we need to recognize that a loaf of barley bread was very n- likely not like the loaf of bread that you might go buy at Walmart or something. It was, it was probably the size of a, a hamburger bun or a hot dog bun, each loaf. So a couple dozen Hamburger buns worth of food. And newly ripened grain. Fresh grain. Uh, The quantity couldn't have been, again, that great because he carried it in his knapsack. However, he's bringing what he has. And he's bringing his first fruits, and that's what's most important. And he's bringing it to Elisha the man of God, not the false idolatrous priests of Baal. But he's bringing it for the purpose of the care of the Lord's servants here, the prophet of the Lord. We can learn much from this man from Baal Shalisha. We can learn that God provides many times through the most obscure means. Suddenly he comes and suddenly he's gone. We don't hear about him again in Scripture. And yet he's faithful, seeking to serve and provide for the Lord's servants and his cause. He's not looking for acknowledgement for himself. He simply wants to be generous in the care of the Lord's and His people. He's one of those who might be surprised on the last day when Jesus says to all those on His right hand, come, come and to my eternal glory. Because even though he might ask, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you to drink? Jesus will say unto him, assuredly I say that you have done this to the least of my brethren. And you have done it to me. It teaches us also how to receive Gifts from those who give in an obscure manner with no desire for return or favors, but just out of love. Is that we would not focus on the man who gives or the person who gives, but that our focus would be on the Lord who has given. The Lord who has provided this food for this man from Baal Shalisha and moved his heart to generosity to give to the servant of the Lord, Elisha, all to the glory of God. I don't believe this man had a personal agenda at all. I don't think he thought for a moment, if I do this, the people will be talking about me for thousands of years. And later some preacher will be praising me from the pulpit in St. George FRC. About this saint in Baal Shalisha. No, it's all about God. It's all about his faithfulness. It's about his provision. It's about his care for his people through, often through his people. Because the Lord indeed loves a cheerful giver. And isn't this so true as you turn and hear Paul's exposition of it in 2 Corinthians 9, where we find. That as he talks about God loving this cheerful giver and that he will multiply these provisions and these gifts, he says, God is able to make all grace abound to you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he says, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. 
Now may him who supplies seed to the sower, he says. It's not about the person who's harvested. It's about he who supplies that seed to the sower, namely God, and bread for food, namely God, and supply and multiply the seed who gives the increase is God. And while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us unto God. It's all to His glory. We learn from the man from Baal Shalisha. We also learn much from the man of God, Elisha, the very mouthpiece of God. And the miracles that he wrought, as we saw that God was with him as he came into Jericho and healed the waters of Jericho by the word of the Lord. As he extended the widow's oil that it would preserve her and her children from, from being sold into slavery because of their debts. As by the grace of God and the empowerment of God and His Spirit, He raises a dead Shunammite son to life. And by the word of the Lord, he heals a pot of stew. This is the very mouthpiece of God that God has given to his people. And now this mouthpiece of God, in the circumstance and enduring the circumstances of famine along with the people of God, is brought this food. And there he is with a hundred of these sons of the prophets. Possibly even they had their families with them. We don't know, just like with the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, there were 5,000 men. Here there's 100 men. It could have been that they had wives. It could have been that they even had children with them. And here comes this man from Baal Shalisha, carrying 20 barley loaves and a little knapsack of grain. Maybe enough, if you rationed it out, for Elisha and his servant Gehazi to live on for a week or so. What would you do with it? The labor is worthy of his hire. I will put it away, and myself and Gehazi, we will have enough to eat for the next week. And you have all these prophets there with nothing to eat. What would you do with it? I, again, I don't think we can comprehend what a famine is. You just had this pot of stew that really was watered down. And there wasn't much for substance in it. And there's nothing to eat. Nothing in the cupboards. Nothing in the freezer. Nothing in the refrigerator. Nothing on the convenience store shelves and the grocery shelves. There's nothing to eat. You're scouring around outside for dandelions and stuff to put into your soup. And now you have, suddenly someone gives you enough food for a week. Would you say, well, let's give to everyone to eat? Notice Elisha's faithfulness. He has compassion on the people. Compassion on the sons of the prophets. Similar to Jesus as he feeds the 5,000. Other gospel accounts says Jesus had pity on them. And so also, Elisha cared for, was compassionate, had pity on these people. And in the faithfulness, he says, feed this to the people. This is a spirit of love and generosity. This is the same spirit as the man from Baal, Shalisha, who wanted to give to the servant of the Lord. And he brings it to the man of God. He didn't necessarily bring it for all these prophets. 
He brought it for the man of God. And, and here the man of God says, have the people sit down and let's, let's eat of this. And faithfulness. He wants to show this spirit of love and generosity as an open hand dispersing the good that he's just received also for others to feed these people. He sees it as God's provision. And he trusts in God's provision. And ultimately, he trusts in God's Word. Notice, in contrast, that to his servant. I can't say with absolute certainty it was Gehazi, but very likely it was Gehazi. Gehazi. His servant said this. What? Shall I set this before a hundred men? Are you crazy? This would provide for us, Elisha, for a while. And certainly it's not even going to touch the hunger in, of these hundred men and maybe even their families. Isn't that kind of what the disciples did too in John chapter 6? Jesus says, sees all these multitudes coming. Oh, they need something to eat. I asked the disciples, well, what do we have? A couple hundred denarii, enough to buy, enough for the disciples and Jesus, but, but certainly not enough to feed the crowds. Well, the gospel accounts, you know that it's late and probably isn't anything available. We also know that there's a lad with a couple loaves of bread and fishes, five loaves of bread and two fish. But what is that among so many, would say the disciples? Isn't that this Gehazi spirit? Not understanding the power of God. Even though they've been seeing miracle after miracle after miracle. Also Gehazi. Witnessing this miracle of the Widow's oil not running out. And of the raising of the Shunammite son. And this pot of stew being healed. And how to say, but what is so, how can we feed so many with just this little bit? See, it's through blessing of faith. Faith in the Word of God. Faith in God's provision. It sets the center stage here. Because Elisha says, give it to the people. Notice how the text says this. Notice Elisha's faith in the Lord and in the word of the Lord. He says, he said again. You can almost hear the tone of Ge Gehazi. What? Should we give this to a hundred people? This is, this is foolishness. And, and and Elisha, you could almost hear him sternly say, Give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, this is the word of God, they shall eat and have some left over. And by faith, they're obedient to the Lord. We find that in, in, in verse 44. And he set it before them. And they ate and had some left over according to the word of the Lord. What a blessing there is when we obey the word of the Lord, when we trust His provision, and there is bread enough and to spare. Well, before we apply that further, I want to look at the greater than Elisha, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only the man of God, but the God-man. The God-man. Let's fast forward in time to the days of Jesus, the God-man, who was a superior prophet. Who was the antitype of Elisha. And there's so many similarities in John chapter 6. Both have a crowd in front of them that are hungry. 
Both Elisha and Christ have compassion and pity on the people. Both of them, all they have for resources are a few loaves of bread. Both of them have an objection raised. That whether it be the Gehazi or whether it be the disciples. And they object and say, this is, this is not enough. And yet both have people who are fed and there are leftovers. But as we learn from the man of God, we find there that he operated by the Word of God. And here we have something far greater in John chapter 6 because now we have the Word of God come down and made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father who's full of grace, full of truth, whose mercy is, endures forever and who's all-powerful because He is the God-man. And that's what makes this miracle even better. You probably haven't heard very many sermons on Elisha feeding the 100. But I'm sure you've heard lots of sermons on Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this miracle is so much better, isn't it? It's not just 100. But take that times 50. 5,000. 5,000. And he does it with less. There's not 20 loaves of barley bread. There's five and some grain. And it's not only grain and, 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 and bread as in the days of Elisha, but with Jesus there's, there's more. There's, there's bread and there's fish. There's an ingredient added. Elisha spoke according to the word of the Lord, and Jesus, who is the word of the Lord, performed it all oh, so much better. And, and Elisha, the, the prophets, those, those hundred men had some left over. Well, when Jesus does this, he asks the disciples to go gather up the fragments, and there's 12 baskets full of fragments, more than what they began with, and everyone was full. But ultimately, it's not just because the circumstances of the miracle is so much better. What's so much better about Jesus and this miracle was that he had a purpose in this miracle, and that purpose was didactic. It was to teach them something and to teach us today. And so his instruction is so much better. Notice early on, he lifts up his eyes as he sees this multitude coming to him, and he asks them this question for a purpose. Notice verse 6. He says, This he said, which was, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? To test him, because he himself knew what he would do. There's a purpose in this miracle, and it's to instruct and to test and as he feeds the 5,000, people are saying, what? This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. This is the greater than Elisha. But how quickly they forget. The following day in verse 22, they're on the other side of the sea. He's telling people, you know, you, you're following me for bread in your stomach. He says in verse 26 of John 6, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. He says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. This is what he wants to teach us. What he wants to teach us is that he is the bread of life. Notice what he says in verse 32. 
Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. And I am the bread of life, says Jesus. I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me shall never hunger again. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I don't care how bad the famine might get. I don't care if you'd be poisoned by some soup. I don't care if you'd be starving and starve even to death. He says, he who believes in me shall never hunger and shall never thirst. Because there's an eschatological, there's an eternal blessing here in Jesus Christ. He gives us an eternal bread. A spiritual bread. That's why I have come down from heaven so that I might give everlasting life and I will raise every single one who believes in me and they will receive everlasting life, body and soul to be with me for all eternity. For in my Father's house there is nothing lacking. His instruction is so much better. When he says, I am the bread of life, in verse 48, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. But this bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I shall give is my bread flesh because there on the cross his body was baked by the wrath of God for your and my sin and there it was prepared how we might feast on him the bread of life and live forever What instruction. We can learn from the God-man, Jesus Christ. And so the ultimate question for you and I today is not whether our, our stomachs are growling of hunger because it's getting close to dinner time. But whether we are spiritually hungry are we hungering and thirsting after christ the living bread are we saying give me jesus else i die i perish spiritually my are you seeking him the bread of life are you seeking his righteousness hungering and thirsting after righteousness and jesus says you will be filled filled with my life because there's sufficiency in Christ to meet all your needs. Doesn't Paul say that in Philippians chapter 4? My God shall supply all your needs, not just according to your needs, but according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Isn't, isn't this remind you of, of what he tells the Ephesians? That God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. He can't even put enough superlatives on this. Super abounding grace of God. Have you ever thought of the beautiful salutations of Scripture? Just I think of Peter, Second Peter. One, grace and peace be multiplied to you. You see, God multiplies His Word. He multiplies His grace. He multiplies His peace. He multiplies His love because of the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why are we so much like the disciples? Or so much like Gehazi. 
It's just not enough. I don't have enough talents. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough. You fill in the blank. There's just not enough. Or maybe you think about it in this way. Jesus just hasn't done enough. How can someone who has died on the cross save me from my sins? And we go around perishing because we don't believe in this bread from heaven. Is that you? Not believing in the word that was made flesh? Not trusting in Jesus? Saying he's not enough? That's what you're saying. And and looking to the world to fulfill all your needs, to fill your belly. Like that prodigal son who went and sought all of the pleasures of this world and to be nourished by this world and finds himself eating the swine husks. And all of a sudden, he comes to his senses. Oh, would you come to your senses today? And to think, in my father's house, there is bread, and bread enough to spare. I will return to my father's house. I will say, hey, just let me be one of your hired servants. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has pity on the 5,000, or Elisha, who had compassion on the hundred, has the same spirit as our Father in heaven, who sees us coming from a long way off and comes out to embrace us and welcome us as his son and, and, and make a royal banquet for his family. Because in the Father's house, there is food and food enough to spare. But there may be someone here who has heard this again and again and again. Just like Israel. Israel who watched that manna come down from heaven every single day, except for Sunday, or the Sabbath day. who never lacked anything, who went and picked it up every day, still perished because of unbelief. Or a Gehazi who had the privilege to be able to distribute this food and watch it continue to to multiply. Or Judas who was among the twelve who was distributing this food and let it multiply and yet perish because of unbelief. Because of covetousness. Oh, how horrible, you would say. The dear congregation, our Savior today comes to us. And he comes as a good shepherd. He comes as the one who has come as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And he comes and he bids us to feast on him. the bread of life. What would you think of one of those hungry sons of the prophets who says, oh, I don't need that food. That was just for Elisha, maybe his servant. Maybe those guys over there, they're good enough, but it's not for me. And refused to eat the bread that was provided directly from the almighty hand of God, according to his word. You'd say that man's a fool. But here the bread of life comes into our midst. And he says, I am the bread of life. And he who eats of me, believes in me, trusts in me, will live forever. Amen. Lord, we give thanks for the beauty of your gospel. 
the beauty of what you have done as such a suitable and sufficient Savior to meet all our needs for both body and soul, for both time and for eternity. We give you thanks that this man from Baal Shalisha could be revealed to us and we could learn from him. We could learn from the man of God, Elisha. But most of all, Lord, may we learn from you, the Lord Jesus Christ, and follow you in faith We pray this in your precious name. Amen.